know, it's strange mixed feelings that one gets uh, watching a procedure like this. This, is, of course, is the price this rhino has to pay to extend its life. And I find it deeply, deeply upsetting. It's March 2023, and I've made a 30-hour journey to the Zululand Rhino Orphanage in KwaZulu-Natal, South Africa. It's run by a highly skilled team who provide 24-hour care, and the rhinos are all happy, healthy, and attentive, almost dog-like. I've never been this close to a rhino before. Not many people have, and I've certainly never had the opportunity to bottle feed a calf. I have to remind myself why they're here. All have been rescued after the slaughter and death of their parents through poaching. What is so amazing is they look so at ease and like they haven't got a trouble in the world. They just look, at, they're living in the moment, aren't they? It's nice to see them at this phase. Yeah. Um, because every single one of them has had an ICU phase where they have been crying for mom. They yeah. have been through horrible trauma. They're stressed. They're you know, in pain if they've had some issues. Um, and it's not a nice process to see. Um, and then once they're out here and they're happy and content, um, I mean, it, it's still heartbreaking because they should be with their moms. They shouldn't be a bunch of babies together yeah. like this. Zululand Rhino Orphanage was created by the Zululand Conservation Trust with helping rhinos in 2017. Founded in 2012 by Simon Jones, Helping Rhinos have so far provided protection to over 1,000 rhinos, and Simon still remembers his very first and heartbreaking encounter. What drew me into this world in the first place, I kind of always had a passion for conservation wildlife, and, and for reasons I always struggled to articulate the rhinos specifically. Um, but actually it was in 2012 when a rhino in the Eastern Cape on the Kareka Game Reserve was poached called, um, we now call it Tandy. Oh, yeah. uh, so that was, I'd spent six weeks on a conservation program previously at the same, mm -hmm. the same reserve. So when that poaching happened, that was the final push for me to say, okay, enough's enough. Her and two other rhinos, there yeah. were three rhinos, they were on the planes, the poachers had come in and they had, uh, they'd not shot them with a normal, normal rifle, they'd used tranquilizer guns. So, yeah. so when they were found in the, the following morning, one of them was, was dead. Yeah. Two of them that we get called Tandy and Temba mm -hmm. were still alive. Yeah. And then that heart-wrenching footage of uh, the vet that we, we work with, Dr. William Folds, working, you know, getting to them and like, well, do we revive them? Do we have to euthanize them? Yeah. But actually, let's do all we can. Um, you know, they'd remove the horn, both horns, and also part of the upper face. It, yeah, so just a hole. Both of them just had this hole in the face and skin hanging off where they'd taken the machetes and just hacked away to get every last bit of horn that they could. I mean, of course, the most remarkable thing is, as I understand it, was that Tandy survived. Not only has she survived, in fact, we're sitting here now in South Africa and two days ago she had her fifth calf since that poaching amazing. incident. How amazing. So, you know, we, we use the caption, every rhino counts yeah. a lot. And, you know, and I think that's a prime example. People questioned whether we were spending too much money on one rhino. Yeah. Well, you know, that one rhino has already become actually six rhinos because her first calf has had a calf. So she's Aww. a grand grandmother now. To be able to get through that and then live the life of a normal rhino and, and you know, be helping the species continue. And to put the scale and impact of rhino poaching into context, the entrance to the orphanage displays a poignant and visceral reminder. Can you explain to me what we're looking at here? Yeah, so this is all skulls of rhinos who are obviously no longer with us. Yeah. Um, a lot of these rhinos have been poached, and you can see in some of them here the big holes in the top of the, the, top of the skull there where yeah. the poachers have dug right into the skull, the sinuses, to yeah. get every last little ounce of that rhino horn out of that head. This should be like that. Yeah. 
and the growth plate will sit on top here. Yeah. Um, and then this will be covered in skin and then the horn will come out here. Uh -huh. So when we dehorn a rhino, we dehorn it above the growth plate yeah. and then everything underneath is still valuable horn. Yes. So the poachers want to take every last bit of it so they'll hack into the face and expose the nasal cavity, which is quite sad because sometimes the animal doesn't die yeah. and it's left with this massive wound on its face and its nasal cavity open. And you can see there's a, a hole from a, a bullet, uh, um, which is how this animal was killed. Was killed, my goodness. With the unprecedented increase in rhino poaching over the last decade, there's been a huge rise in the number of rhino calves left orphaned. Sometimes the rhino baby is left grieving over the loss of its mother. But on many occasions, the calf is seriously injured as the poachers attack the baby to stop it, interrupting them while they remove its mother's horn. This is all the animals in the facility. Yeah. And we have successfully released eight animals back into the wild. And are they all tagged then when they go? Or? They are. Um, they either have a foot collar yeah. or the new technology is a horn pod. Oh, yeah. um, and so that allows you to follow up on them. And we require that for at least 18 months to uh -huh. two years. After that, we know that they've settled nicely yeah. and then they can take it off take and it they off. can yeah. be wild. And the horn is basically keratin, is that right? Exactly. Like our fingernails, yes. basically. Yes. So uh, all of this uh, hocus pocus about rhino horn is such rubbish. Yes. You could just tell the people who want it to, if they want to make rhino horn cake, make the fingernail, fingernail cake. cake. Exactly, <laughs> absolutely. Yes. The other problem, though, is that it's also a status symbol. Um, so because it's. Um, there isn't much of it, you know, there's a yeah. limited amount of rhinos. Um, it's very, very expensive. Yeah. Um, so the people that do get a hold of it, they have quite a high status. Yes. So Horrible. they tend to make these rhino horn um, dagger handles and things to display, um, not just yeah. medicinal value. Yeah. Poaching has been the number one threat and yeah. has been for the last 15 years. Um, you know, we were losing, you know, Back at 2014, 2015, we were losing 1,200 rhinos a year wow. to poaching. You know, that's between three and four a day. We're okay. still losing one a day. I mean, can you imagine we've been out here today, you know, doing some, seeing some rhinos out in the wild, and yet for every day we've been here, the likelihood is that a rhino will have been killed by poachers somewhere. In South Africa, game reserves are either privately owned or government state owned. And it's surprising to learn that the fate of the rhino very much depends on which of the two they are born on. I mean, if you just look at the stats, um, 244 rhinos were lost in state-owned parks last year, and only 16 in privately owned reserves in the province of yeah. KZN. Um, and that is, is, is as a result of the fact that a lot of the private parks partner with entities such as Helping Rhinos yeah. in order to increase their efforts um, to protect and, and look after their rhino. The game has changed substantially. Tell me why. Well, before we were doing conservation work yeah. and everyone that were working in parks were field rangers that were focused on, on animal behavior, monitoring, and obviously there was a level of, of, of protection. Now we're fighting a rhino war and you have to be a... Um, you know, military trained yes. to be able to do your job nowadays. Yeah. So the game's changed and the cost has become excessive. Mm -hmm. No one can even afford to look after animals anymore. Um, and specific, specifically rhino. Yeah. You know, a couple of years ago, we saw a significant disinvestment in rhino as a result of the fact that it was just become cost prohibitive to look after them and protect yeah. them. Quite unexpectedly and unbeknown to us while we were filming, the orphanage was alerted to a one week old calf in a neighboring reserve that was close to death and in desperate need of their help. Within hours of receiving the call, the team had collected him and prepared a program of 24-hour intensive care. We literally just received this new rhino orphan. It's a little male. It's estimated to be about one week old. Um, he's just arrived. We've just managed to weigh him and put him inside the container. You can see he's really, really chilled. We haven't had to put a blindfold or earplugs in, um, and he's already had 500 uh, moles of milk. Do you know, it's I, I, I get terribly moved when I see this because this uh, this beautiful rhino is so vulnerable. Yes. Um, 
What are you what, what are you giving him at the moment? I'm giving him a um, milk formula. Yeah. Um, so it's very, very important for him to get the nutrients that he needs at this stage. Yeah. Um, at this age, he won't be eating any solids, any grass. So he's fully reliant on getting his nutrients from milk. At this stage, this baby is very, very young, um, only a week old. Um, he does have a very wet cough, so we're a little bit concerned that he is showing signs of pneumonia. Looks like he's going to have a sleep now, isn't he? He's quite content now, yeah. so we say that they go into a little bit of a milk coma. Yeah. Um, I would like it if he finished all his milk, but at this stage he's very small, so I think that's about as and much it, as he Also, can he handle. seems to know when he's had enough, doesn't yeah, he? Yeah, yeah. Which is absolutely lovely. Yeah, you can see how full his tummy is now. Yeah. Yeah. Simon very kindly said that um, I could name him uh, as I've come here for my first time to see the amazing work you do. <laughs> I am uh, very, very touched by it. It's, excuse me for getting um, a bit emotional because this is, I mean, this is so vulnerable, isn't it? You had had a talk um, with one of the managers here and came up with an interesting name. What was the name you came up with? Kalula. And what does Kalula mean? Kalula means easy. So he, um, he was showing a little bit of feistiness when he arrived, but um, compared to all the other babies that we've had, quite an easy baby. I don't want to yeah. jinx it. It's yes. still early yeah. days. Um, but yeah, he's... And I think... Unfortunately, because we've had so many babies in the last few months, yeah. that we just have a lot of experience now, yeah, so it is getting So Kalula, could we shorten Kalula to Lula? Yeah. And Lula mm. is easy, yes? Yes. Well, I think you've just named him. <laughs> I think that's wonderful. I think Lula is the most wonderful name. Baby and Lula. I hope that we're going to be using it for many years to come. Yeah. On close inspection, it was discovered that Lula's health was worse than they first thought. Dr. Mike Toft, director and veterinarian at Zululand Wildlife Treatment Center, was called to determine his condition and decide on a way forward. Um, but we'll start him on a long-acting antibiotic now. We'll give him some multivits as well, just to try and perk him up a little bit. And I was just saying to Simone, I think we should start looking at nebulizing him as well for a few days. Uh, you, with a normal mask? With a mask, yeah. You, what you do is, for you, yeah, but you don't have to. You can use a Coke bottle. Um, works really well. You just chop the bottom of a two-liter bottle off and stick the nozzle in the end of the, and then you, it goes right over. Then okay. And what you can do is just take some elastoplast, stick it around the edge so it's not sharp, and then it kind of seals nicely without it digging in. The fate of orphan rhinos like Lula exists because of the increase in poaching. We visited a school that had been recently built where the children of Zululand could receive an education and learn the importance of animal conservation and protection. This, however, is a long-term solution to a very immediate problem. So I was invited to join a team who are undertaking one of the more instant, effective, but controversial strategies, controlled dehorning. No matter how many times you do this, it's always an upsetting time. It must be. When you have to take this horn off of the so rhino. So invasive, isn't it? Mm, yeah. it's, it's, it's really horrible, but, but unfortunately this process, especially here in KwaZulu-Natal, has yeah. proved to be a very effective deterrent yeah. to poaching. But it, but it is hard, you know, yeah. rhinos have horns for a reason. Absolutely. But, but, but what, what it does is keeps them alive yeah. um, or it improves, improves their chances of staying alive from poaching. But for me, you, you kind of get upset when you see it I because bet. you feel yeah. like you're, you're taking something off the rhino. Yeah. You know, and it's, it's shocking. I mean, uh, uh, it's certainly new to me, this. I mean, I had heard about dehorning, um, that one has to go to such an in invasive extreme to uh, protect a species that has been with us for so long on this, yeah. on this planet. And uh, it is so inhuman, isn't it? Inhumane. It is. Um, um, it, it is, yeah. I mean, it's a, it's a topic that 
that you know is controversial, I guess, yeah. uh, or is upsetting, yeah. let's say, to, to When to you say it's people. controversial, do you mean people object to it? Some people object to it, and, and they say reason? we should leave the rhino with its horn, it's yeah. natural, you know, you're taking something off that it needs, and it, and it has, a, has a horn for a reason. There's others that will say, better to have a live rhino. We do find that it reduces the risk of poaching, Yeah. Um, but it's not the answer because it, um, it almost moves the poaching to an area where they're not dehorning. Yeah. So yes, on this reserve, we could be protecting our population, but the Making risk is just moving somewhere yeah, yeah, else. Yeah, you're passing the parcel, um, yeah. And then also in areas where all the animals are dehorned, um, then poachers have gone into those areas and killed the animals anyway. And so are they, is that like for bush meat or other things? Make it's it, also for the horn. It's also for um, what remains of the horn. Yes. And so, yeah, there's no pain associated with it. It's rather hard to watch if you've never seen it before. Um, it's quite a, an emotional feeling when you see a rhino having its horn taken off with a chainsaw. But bear in mind that that rhino stands a 96% better chance of surviving two years than if we leave its horn on. That's how effective our dehorning process is. Upon tracking the target rhino, Mike darts the mammal from the air, a high pressure and skillful procedure. The drug used has taken 30 years to develop and results in the lowest possible risks to the rhino. Within minutes, he's fallen to the ground, completely sedated. Immediately, the team get to work, adding a blindfold and earplugs to ensure the least possible stress from the surrounding commotion. Blood work is taken and embedded microchip scanned so they can confirm the rhino identity. Hair is collected from his tail with a sample of skin carefully cut away to ensure access to a full DNA profile. Finally, Mike fires up his chainsaw and begins the task of removing his horns. He's carried out this procedure 3,000 times before, so wields the power tool with remarkable skill and dexterity, ensuring the cut is as clean and smooth as he can possibly make it. This is my first time seeing it, and even though I know why it's happening and the potential repercussions if it doesn't, I'm both shocked and deeply emotional. You know, it's a strange um, mixed feelings, of course, one gets uh, watching a procedure like this. This, of course, is the price this rhino has to pay to extend its life, but it's, you feel like a prized part of its body is being stolen. Um, from him, and um, I find it deeply, deeply upsetting. It, it makes you want to cry, to be yeah. honest, you know, the That's fact that we have to go yeah. through this. With the team cleared, Mike prepares to administer an antidote, another carefully developed drug that will ensure the rhino is awake within minutes. If I could just say, um, <coughs> very upset, that was... Remarkable. It's quite an emotional thing to watch. You know, we, we've become very hardened to it yeah. simply because this is in the 3,000th odd rhino that I've done now. And, um, but I, I kind of look at it like we were talking earlier. This rhino, in two years' time, you'll be able to revisit him. He's going to be here still. Yeah. And if this is what we have to do, well, this is what we have to do. Absolutely. But it, but it can't help. You, th you think. Here is this magnificent animal losing such a prized possession. But wonderful work. Yep. No, and this is the way we've got to do it. Yeah, yeah. We yeah. don't have a choice. Yeah, absolutely. And once, once it's up, the nice thing, like I said to you before, is, is to see how well they cope with yeah. this whole procedure. Yeah. Yes, it's a traumatic procedure in its looks, but once the rhino's up, Really show any major problem. That's amazing. And with his permission and watching carefully, I have the privilege of injecting the syringe. And once in, we must move quickly because the speed at which the rhino awakens is very surprising and if we're in the wrong place, could potentially be very dangerous. Thank you so much. We watch the rhino wake from sedation 
This is a complete reversal of the sedation with absolutely no ill effects. Finally, he disappears into the thick of the bush to rejoin his crash, the collective term for rhinos. I'm invited to take to the air for one last look. That's magical, isn't it? Yeah, man. Do you feel that you're winning? I think we are winning on some fronts and losing on others. Yeah. For, for right. instance, private reserves are able to protect their honor to the point where they're on, on, on the increase and yeah. we're seeing very good population growth. And we know the state owned parks are in, the populations are in decline, which is a big gap to close yeah. between the two. And that is obviously a major concern. I am concerned for the future of rhinos and pangolins and most of the other species that are being trafficked um, because the population is growing, human population is growing at a point where it's becoming increasingly difficult to make environmental issues and wildlife protection issues at the top of people's lists. Yeah, and habitat, etc. Exactly. Right. When you yeah. when you are, are battling to feed your family, environmental issues are not quite high on your priority Sure, list. of course. And, and totally understandable. I mean, and uh, so it seems to me what I'm getting from this that the um, most important thing that an individual who's interested can do is to support um, a charity like Helping Rhinos, really. Absolutely, yeah. because they are critical partners for us and we wouldn't be able to do what we do if it wasn't with support from them. Yeah. If you had a single message that you could give to the public, what would that message be? So the, my message to the public would be, you know, rhinos are in real threat and real danger of going extinct mm -hmm. from this planet. So please get behind the work that the likes of Helping Rhinos do mm -hmm. um, to keep them safe um, and keep, give them a future on this planet. Wonderful. Before I leave, I want to pay one last visit to Lula Boy to find out whether the antibiotics and nebulizer are having a positive effect. In some ways, he's become the face of the orphanage for me, a totem for everything they represent. Without them, he'd be dead. Another life lost through the effects of poaching. He had a visit from the vet. Um, he had some antibiotics yeah. injected. Um, and the vet suggested that we nebulize him three times a day. Uh -huh. So we just did a nebulizing session. Wonderful. Which he seemed to do really well with. His breathing became much deeper. Oh, wonderful. Um, instead of this rapid, shallow breathing. Yeah. And the rapid, shallow breathing is because he has pneumonia, is that correct? Yes. And so the vet obviously gave him some kind of um, injections for that, did he? Uh, yeah, yeah. lung-acting antibiotics. Uh -huh. So it'll last for about three days. Yeah. And then in three days' time, we'll reevaluate, but he'll probably have it again. Wonderful. Yeah. Once the antibiotics start kicking in, we hope to see an increase yeah. in activity and just, you right. know, he's basically just drinking and sleeping and peeing yeah. and sleeping and yeah. drinking and sleeping. I'll have to keep in touch with him as he grows up now. Definitely. Come visit him in a year Def and see oh, how he's grown. Yeah, I shall look forward to that. Yeah. That would be wonderful. As I embark on my 30-hour journey back to the UK, I reflect on Lula Boy and the other orphans whose mothers have been slaughtered. I reflect on the people who save them and the money raised to fund their work. And I reflect on the solutions, many of which are effective but controversial. But most of all, I reflect on the fact that there are thousands of rhinos who have been killed by humans for the ubiquitous and pharmaceutically inert chemical that is nothing more than a fingernail. Keratin. It might be my imagination, but he looks ever so slightly bigger. <laughs> it's not your imagination, yeah. it happens. Does it? They grow so quickly. Yeah, wow. I mean, in 
a week if he's drinking really well, he could probably put on two, three kilograms. Really? Um, at this age already.